The Bliss of the Abyss. Once upon a time in a land far away, a poor farmer and his wife lived all alone. They were very lost. With Robert Newmark Jones. Welcome to the Bliss of the Abyss with your host, Ruskin Denmark. Robert Newmark Jones. It's me, it's me, it's me. I'm back, I'm back. Like Beavis and Butthead is back. That's right. They're rebooting Beavis and Butthead. Can you believe it? Is it time? Just what the world has been crying out for. Uh, this week on The Bliss of the Abyss, we have President Obonjo coming on to talk about the year anniversary of the attempted coup of the Laughter Republic. It's quite a tale, so strap yourself in for that coming up in a minute. But first, I've got to tell you about Hastings. Go to Hastings. It's great. That's my, uh, <laughs> that's my recommendation. What? Did you want more? Go to Hastings. It's really great. How about that? There we go. I doubled down. I told you everything you need to know. Um, uh, so I'm not going to waste too much time on this intro here. I've got a really, really good conversation with President Obonjo coming up. And we talk about all different kinds of things. We talk about the attempted coup. We talk about comedy during lockdown. We talk about Zoom gigs, drive-in gigs, and what he would do if he was in charge of this country. Um before before we go into that conversation, just quickly, if you wouldn't mind, in the show notes, I'm going to put a link to the Save Live Comedy campaign. We discuss it a bit during our phone call, but the UK government currently does not class live comedy as one of the acts. So the big rescue stimulus, 1.57 billion that was announced, is not going to help the comedy industry at present. This is obviously a ridiculous state of affairs. So many of the beloved international acts and national and even smaller, like regional acts, a lot of them are born and bred on the live circuit scene. And they cut their teeth and they pay their dues gigging. And it's a lifeblood of this, of the, of this country. A lot of talent goes through it. I've seen a lot of people who are now big names starting very small and becoming very big. And where else to hone their craft than live comedy, than pubs, clubs, theatres, and anywhere that's a dedicated comedy venue currently is not getting the support that it needs to survive. And I think within the next year, it's something like 70, 70 to 80 percent, maybe 77. Maybe I'm just making that number up. I don't know, but I seem to remember thinking it, um, reading it somewhere, uh, are th- being threatened with closure. So it's really important, actually, that we do what we can. I think this country, actually, has really come together and rallied behind some really important things during this lockdown. We've had the NHS um, clapping. (laughs) No, we've had, obviously, we've had a massive groundswell of people supporting the NHS, and the government has sometimes lagged behind that. But in terms of what people's priorities are, and we've had a lot of job retention schemes we've had furloughing stuff we've had self-employed people being given money we've had now the arts finally being given money i think it's overdue that comedy is actually recognized and put in the arts and it also gets its own lifeline now it needs it it's ridiculous that it doesn't have it so without any further ado please sign that and please enjoy my conversation with the president Dictator for life of the Laughter Republic, President Obonjo. Hello. Hello. How are you? Uh, Aha, I'm very well. How are you? I'm good. Can't complain. (laughs) Good. Welcome to the Bliss of the Abyss, President Obonjo. Thank you so much. I'm glad that you have called me. Yes, well, it's a it's a very prestigious occasion. Um, it's a year almost to the day that uh, there was an attempted coup upon yeah. your, upon your life, upon your dictatorship, benevolent dictatorship. Sorry, I should just uh, what, say. Uh, 
upon our people as well. Us honorary laughter republic citizens. Um, now, seeing as it's been a year to the day, uh, may I suggest some kind of official parade, maybe a public holiday? Look, um, if you have been following the laughter republic uh, Broadcasting Corporation, because we took over BBC Studios and E4, they no longer exist. <laughs> I made an announcement a couple of days ago that we are going to be celebrating and marking the occasion, and that 17th of July is now a national holiday. Oh, my God. And I will be making a special broadcast on the 17th of July, 2020, which uh, is, I believe, on Friday. That is on Friday. That's five days from now as we record. Mm. Can you tease any any of the information that's going to be in this special broadcast? I don't. My people have said I shouldn't reveal because <laughs> one of the things that we found out when the Comedy Bureau Agency and the FBI investigated what happened last year is we have to be careful what information we share. Right. Because okay. we don't know whether mm. these people are still very much uh, wanting to repeat what they did last year. I ah, doubt it. I they, see. They, were they would. They surely they wouldn't dare again, but I do understand what you're saying. Loose lips sink ships. Yeah, so. I think all your all your listeners, all your all that your listeners need to know. Yes. Is look out on the 17th of July. They can come to my fan page or my Twitter, and uh, I will be making a special broadcast to celebrate a special day, not just in the history of that republic, but a special day in the history of Britain. <laughs> oh, it's a very big statement. Um, now, I mean, for those for those people, idiots, fools who do not know all the details of what we're talking about, can you fill them in with a bit of the origin story of how there was an attempted coup upon you? Well, I remember the day very clearly, my friend. On the seventeenth of July, twenty nineteen, uh, I uh, visited the. Twitter, because my people at times are uh, always saying that I need to keep up to speed, and I've been trying to compete with Donald Trump in terms of getting more followers. <laughs> so I remember that day very well. I uh, decided to check my Twitter account, and um, lo and behold, I saw an article written by Chotul Magazine. Mm. And uh, Chotul, as you know, is a, a comedy trade magazine. That comedy all hub, videos. all things yeah, comedy. comedy. Yeah. All the comedians read it, actually. Yeah. No one else reads it apart from comedians. Yeah, Not even part of the problem. Lovers. But that is, that is another matter. <laughs> and when I read it, I just realized that, wow, there was this splash article that basically said E4 uh, is launching a new African dictator TV show. And, you know, lots of column inches, my friend. And mm. I was reading it. And I had no idea it was about me. <laughs> until I saw the reference below that basically said this character is very similar to the character that President Abonjo has been performing uh, over the last uh, 10 years. Yeah. And, you know, I, I had all sorts of mixed emotions. Number one, I said to myself, wow, this is really, really interesting. This is an interesting development. Mm -hmm. Yep. If they make a mistake, and because the photograph of who the new African dictator <laughs> was, and obviously he's black, so I just thought maybe they made a mistake and they right. chose the wrong black person, uh, because you know they can never ever recognize black people. The so, so and, you thought they've just pulled the wrong, for, like that yeah. time they got the, the taxi driver on to talk about economic yeah, exactly. policy, and he yeah, had. So I, <laughs> I just thought they had done the same. At one point, I thought, okay, my, maybe it's not me. Maybe they've given it to Lenny Henry. I could understand that. But it wasn't Lenny Henry. They actually gave it to this character called Colonel Banjoko. Colonel so Banjoko. Now, Colonel so is, is a rank way below president as well. Yeah. And I just posted on Twitter, interesting comments. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't even understand the impact of what they had done. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't actually as angry as the people, my people, the white soldiers within the comedy industry, <laughs> sweeping left, right, and center, before I knew what was happening, the thing had mushroomed into justice for Bonjo. I then realized that, wow, they actually stole my car. You know, you know what it is? Something's happening to you, but you, 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 you deny it. But this can't be true. This, this must be just a dream. Yeah. Before I knew what happened, 
it was all over Twitter. My people were out there protesting. You know, it was, you know, what is what was really interesting about last year right. was the fact that I am not supposed to be the sort of dictator who is fighting for justice. <laughs> but in, 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 I am out there and people are fighting for me. It made a mockery of democracy. Right. It, in fact, if anything, it proved that dictatorship is a, is a more efficient way of running the country. Most definitely, my friend, because, it, I, I, because I know if that happened in a democratic um, uh, country, and I must say in Britain it isn't democratic, but you know what I mean. <laughs> they would have had to pass a law. They would have written a white yeah. paper or green paper. We need to investigate. They would debate it in parliament before they, this happened so swiftly. I mean, it was it was it was almost like Black Lives Matter, you know, <laughs> Karate comedy Lives Matter. It, what, it happened. I it was I was in total. It was it went out of my hands. It was no longer about me being angry, but it was about the comedy community mm. being very very angry. Well, before I, I knew what was happening, uh, someone from my Facebook contact had been in touch with me to say, "Look, I know how we could possibly resolve this. Mm. Do you?" wants to meet BBC Studios. Ooh. I was shocked. That was quick. I, how, and how, how quickly did it happen from the news being announced to someone being in touch with you? So the, the news was, um, well, it, it was, um, the news came out on the 17th of July. Yeah. Uh, by the 19th of July, someone had been in touch with me. There we go. Because the Twitter storm was unbelievable because they had damaged their brand. Mm -hmm. You know, they said he's a fictional character. I, you know, President Bonjo is a fictional character. <gasps> you know, exiled. President Bonjo is exiled. Bombastic. Yes, they even stole. They even stole my comedy creator's name. My comedy creator's name is Bankole. They turned that to Banjoko. I mean, it it's crazy. It's so yeah, flagrant. It and if there's, if there's one thing that the comedy community cannot stand, it's injustice. Like, yeah. I think comics are obsessed with justice. Yeah. So, so two days later, BBC Studios get in touch with you. They want to they have a sit down. They want to work out what's going on. What do you say? Uh, I can't really go into the details of oh. it. Because <laughs> oh! We are not releasing. I certainly am not releasing the details of the conversation until 30 years later. However... All I can confidently say is that I met with BBC Studios mm -hmm. and we could not reach an agreement. Oh, no. Yeah. However, what they did was they did the pilot while I was in Edinburgh on my speaking engagement. But my understanding was the pilot was shit. Sorry <laughs> for my the pilot was shit. Sorry for my French. <laughs> you know, the pilot was no good. Um, and I don't think they have been able to broadcast it uh, commissioned it as a result. No. Besides, I was ready to fight tooth and nail. I would have got Donald Trump, uh, Kim Jong Un, uh, the Chinese leader. We would have made sure that there was a protest at the BBC <laughs> if, they went, if they went ahead with the commission. Right. Now, I've also tried to find tapes and I've tapped up my contacts and uh, no one seems to have any tapes of it. I think it was just sort of they filmed it, they watched it back, and they burned all the evidence straight away. It seems like it was a miscarriage of justice in every way. A miscarriage? Or a miscarriage? You know what's really interesting? Mm -hmm. I have to be entirely honest with you. Mm -hmm. When I started my own investigation, I was almost like Inspector Columbia. <laughs> I did my own investigation. And I have to say to you, I was quite surprised by the number of people who knew about this story i am very surprised still surprised by the number of people who knew this was happening yeah and it's made me a bit paranoid yeah because uh, well, some people knew some people knew that this was happening they never said anything to me even Trottle, when Trottle actually made that article and published it they never even contacted me but they referenced me in that article right I found that really, really odd. I find that very strange, definitely. Yeah. And did you have any contact with um, with Samson? Uh, who no. was No. I, I didn't have any contact with Samson, but I have to say this to you. Yeah. One of the things that I did, which people were saying was um, good leadership, 
was the fact that you know how toxic the comedy industry is, especially yeah. when it comes to film. Yeah, a yeah, yeah. Not, I was... A lot of people, a lot of people did not know that he wasn't a comedian. He's just a comedy actor. Just comedy actor. Yeah. So, lots of comedians were attacking him on Twitter. I had to ensure that my people produced a press statement, and this is real. We produced a press statement to say, "Leave him alone." Mm. From what we can gather, it's not him that we should be attacking, but actually, we should be attacking the TV executives. Yeah, right. Although, and, then, and, then they, stopped, and they stopped, and they stopped attacking. And they stopped. Him. Yeah, your loyal army backed off. <laughs> yeah, somehow he was just pushed to the forefront. But it's like, it's like in any well, any corporation, it's like someone is put forward to take the bullet, but the the real truth is hidden a few layers back and it's uh, it's the people making the decisions and pulling the strings isn't it yeah but for me it is more about the fact that i have to say to you some people you, you just mentioned it you said you've been in touch with your contacts mm. i don't have those sort of contacts with the bbc because i'm a dictator, <laughs> I'm a dictator. Right. however i know people who are connected yeah. i also know people who were working for the bbc who were quietly supporting me mm -hmm. during that campaign last year, Justice for Bonjo. So it's made me, to be honest with you, it's made me really, really paranoid about people. I'm not saying I don't trust people, but I'm very, very suspicious now. Right. You know, I, you, you can't you can't go through because I almost lost ten years mm. of work that I have done. I mean, if it had <laughs> actually if it had been commissioned and turned into a show and become a hit, like it, there was a real possibility that it would have sort of overshadowed the last decade of your work. Yeah, exactly. And what would have happened, even though, you know what was really interesting, is the the support was both positive and negative. Mm. The positive are widely negative from the comedy industry. Mm. But there were a number of people who were saying to me, not even thinking about my mental state, but they were writing on Twitter, what is he supposed to do now? Ten years of his work is mm. gone. How is he going to recover? But actually, I saw it. I'm going to fight tooth and nail. I know what um, um, I know what um, sacrifices have made over the last mm. ten years. Yeah, I'm not going to let this ride. Even if it kills me, I'd probably be the first dictator that they said died because of comedy. <laughs> I was prepared to go tooth and nail. <laughs> yeah, tooth and nail, my friend. You know, because I am the original yeah. African dictator. The yeah. only one in the UK performing comedy. Someone said to me, one of the positives is this. Someone said to me, if you are performing comedy in the UK and you don't know President Abonjo, then you're not doing comedy. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, and that's... I'm not bragging, yeah. No, 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 it's just true. That's why when I when I heard the news about it, I looked up Samson, I was like, oh, he's he didn't maybe know because he's not a stand-up. Like, actually, he, he he probably is a bit innocent in this. Like he just he acts in funny things on TV, but that's not the same thing as being on the circuit or no, knowing people performing in clubs, doing mics, etc. You know, that's a it's a different world. The comedy industry, like you say, it's like part of the reason it's toxic at times is because it's insular. You know, a lot of people know everyone, and there's a lot of there's a lot of things going on that we wish were different, but have been that way for a long time, and we don't have the power to change. If yeah, you see but, what I mean. But, but the, the thing, the, you know, I, I have, as as the days go by, I have flashbacks, mm. both positive and negative, about the old incident. Because look, 10 years of your work was almost taken away from you. Can mm. you imagine what that would have meant? Ugh. However, what's really interesting is they just recently, as you know, there's a campaign because COVID, general COVID, has disseminated the the comedy industry. Yeah. This, this campaign called Save Save, Save Live, Live comedy. comedy. I'm gonna I'm gonna now, attach it to this episode. I do remember, what I can reveal is they think when I say they, TV executives actually believe that the live comedy circuit is full of itself. It's it's in its own bubble, and uh, you know it's not really important. However, what you would have noticed from the Save Live campaign, all those TV comics who tweeted about the campaign actually said. I started my comedy career in the live comedy circuit. Mm. So we are important. Mm. Not everybody is going to be able to go on TV, but we are the basis and foundation mm -hmm. for TV comedy. Yeah, yeah? absolutely. Yes, it is a different skill. 
but you learn the, 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 the act of performing, the act of performing comedy in the circuit. Yes. So when I was reading some of the comments, the negative flashbacks of those discussions I had with the TV executives got me really, really angry. Because they're now saying, We're saving. nobody's saying save TV comedy. <laughs> People are saying save live comedy. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, well, yeah. it does make sense because I also I also work in theatre, and obviously, um, we we you know that that industry has been really hit hard by by COVID and all of that stuff. But the difference is, and some people might not know this, is that the UK government does not currently class stand up comedy as an art form. So that big grant, that one point five seven billion for live entertainment, none of that is going to comedy. It's a joke. <laughs> I will ask you this question, and I'm not gloating because I'm part of the comedy industry. Even though people say, I don't know why people call me a comedian. I don't see myself as a comedian. I'm just a president who gives funny speeches and people start looking. I don't know why they laugh. But on a serious note, I will say to you, you know that the comedy industry is full of left-wing comics. Yes, yeah? there's a lot. You of have them. more left-wing comics than right. Than right-wing comics. 100%. Comic. Yeah. yeah. Yep. No. Do you honestly think that the Tory government will support the live comedy industry? <sighs> I know, I know. What can we do? What can we do to make them do we it, though? To, we have to try. We, we have, have to try. try. We have to it try. makes you question, especially when you have a situation where some comedians, they should leave it to me. I am the opposition leader of the British democracy. You know, and all these people who criticize the British government, are they really helping when mm. they go on stage? That's just meant to be a joke. But on a serious note, <laughs> I think there are, real, there, there are real issues. I think there are real issues in terms of the government wanting... What, what, okay, if, yeah, some argue that it's not an art form, but it's entertainment. We are supporting. Do you know how many people we have, we have, we have helped in terms of their mental health when they go out mm -hmm. to gigs? Yeah. yeah. And I, think, I, think, I, think, I think it is snobbery by the British I government. I think it's snobbery not, as well. Not, not, to give, not to give the money. And I have to say to you, the British government is likely to be the first, the first government to experience uh, a, a, a coup because they're not supporting <laughs> life community. Now, maybe don't announce a coup on the podcast. Maybe, uh, you know, allegedly... There might be a coup, allegedly, you know. Well, okay, That's allegedly. Just... <laughs> well, any, any, well any, anyone who takes what I've said seriously, then <laughs> there's a problem. I mean, they haven't got a sense of humor. I think, I, I hope, look, I think this campaign, actually, the Save Live Comedy campaign, I think it's got a lot of momentum behind it. And part of the reason that the arts just got that package was because there was so much momentum, there were big voices behind it. And hopefully, with enough pressure something will change and there will be, um, you know, some, some move forwards. I mean, I, I noticed that you're, you've been doing, you're, you're going to a driving gig, aren't you, this evening? Have you done any Zoom gigs? Have you done any driving gigs before? How's that been for you? Well, interestingly enough, my people called me today because I have a Sunday to rest. And uh, a Sunday to rest, I'm not even making love to my wife. I just like to rest. <laughs> However... Um, someone called me today and said there is uh, some complimentary tickets to go and watch a driving gig not far from where I live mm. in Luton. Mm. Um, so I'm going there to have a look. Um, Zoom gigs, I haven't put myself out there. No. So I don't apply for Zoom gigs. People actually ask me to come and perform. Um, I've done probably about five Zoom gigs. Out of five, four have really been really, really good. Um, I think Zoom gigs are good. I think that's the way to go. What really irritates me is the fact that I see all these audiences. They are looking at my cotton and they're criticizing my cotton. They're not even getting up to pledge allegiance to me. Because normally in a live comedy scene, they will get up and pledge allegiance. They are holding a glass of wine, sitting on their chairs. I know. To perform. I think that is very insulting for my presidency. But that is the way it goes. It's the way and, it goes, you know, isn't it? Yeah, you, you, it's like you, you're not able to control them as much, you know? Yeah, yeah. But that's the way, that's the way it goes. Oh, well, I remember, I remember performing, um, performing. Uh, I went to go and see my mom, and mm. um, and when I was uh, there to go and see my mom, uh, I had the Zoom gig, so I had to do the Zoom gig in her house. And believe mm -hmm. it or not, I wore the uniform to my mom's place. She thought I was really, really mad. Like, look, what's wrong with you? Right? I did this to entertain my friends. And um, 
you know, you've seen me perform and, you yeah. know, I'm bombastic and, you know, I do what I need to do. And I was doing the gig in that room. And she asked me to keep quiet because she was watching Donald Trump. Oh, my God. Yeah. You know. You know. Well, but, you know, wow. My mom doesn't appreciate my comedy. Well, okay. no, it's often the way, though, isn't it? It's like you're doing the same thing as someone else, but because because it's your mom, she's like, oh, quiet down, Abonjo. I'm watching, you know, fucking idiot Trump over here talk his nonsense with his tiny yeah. hands. Um, uh, so you, you actually, that's interesting because I've spoke to a few comedians and a lot of them seem frustrated by the Zoom gigs, but you say you've actually had... Can you so so? I've got a question. Can you can you tell you know when you're when you're crushing? Obviously, when you're live, you can tell when you're killing because mm-hmm. there's that vibe in the air. The laughs start to roll. You start mm-hmm. to tag on top. But with that, mm-hmm. with the zoom and the slight delay and the being isolated, can you feel it as much? Like that's that's what puts look, me off. My, look, look, my friend. You know what's really interesting is that, like I said to you, you are asking me questions about performing comedy, you know, because I, I don't see myself as a comedian, but, you know, I will answer your question. <laughs> and you see, they, they, this is the thing. I think people need to understand is what they should treat Zoom gigs like when they first started their first gig. What was it like when you started right. your first gig? What was right. it like when you did your first open mic gig? You were worried. You were scared. You didn't know what you were doing. But it does get better. That's point number one. Right. Point number two, depending on who is running the gig, that's the key thing. Some comedy promoters have been able to find a way of making sure that when you are performing, you can hear the laughter so mm. they don't mute people. Yeah, that's point number two. Mm. Point number three, if you are a real comic and you have been performing comedy for a number of years, you will know where your punchlines are, don't you? Yes, yeah? of course. So the whole idea is when you're delivering your gig on the Zoom, pause as soon as you deliver your punchline. Right. To Tru- see whether you will get laughter. That's it. So you trust in the material. And you're yeah, like... you trust. You have to trust your material. If mm. you do not trust your material, you are going to die on your ass on the Zoom gig, and you will have a Zoom funeral. <laughs> Zoom <laughs> funeral, right there and then. And have you been? Have you been performing any sort of COVID material, or has it? I try. Yeah. I try. I try. I try because this is the thing. I think what makes my comedy unique is that I don't follow what other people do. Because it is so obvious that mm. everybody will want to talk about the lockdown. Yeah? yeah so course. I try to make it different. I don't want to talk about it. It's okay, fine. I have a joke about General COVID. I have, a, I have a joke about the fact that this is the first time a civilian prime minister has put me under house arrest. <laughs> yeah? That's the lockdown. <laughs> and it's no coincidence that when you put a military dictator under house arrest, you end up in hospital. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> exactly. Now, now, that is very different from someone else who is another comedian who wants to talk about, oh, yeah, I am with my wife and I can't stand her or we've discovered things about... So you have to yeah. play it in such a way that suits your own uh, ma- material. So I try not to... I- I've heard people talk about, oh, next year in Edinburgh, people are going to be talking about oh, COVID. My God. The, only, the good thing is that you must identify your own unique selling point. I'm certainly not going to be talking about COVID when I go to Edinburgh. Oh, my God. And I certainly, I certainly don't talk about... I don't do it like I should do it. I mean, Abonjo, can you imagine how many Edinburgh shows there are going to be with with puns for, I mean, you know, okay, the first one that springs to mind, there's going to be a group of people and they're going to call themselves the Flu Man Group. Mm-hmm. And they're yeah. going to be yeah. like dressed in the atom of the like COVID molecule. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. exactly, the B fifty two flus. I mean, there's there's yeah. going to be it's going to be overrun. Yeah, but how many how many people can talk about um about about being under house arrest by a civilian prime minister? Is that not so, many? So has it been yeah. difficult? I mean, because you know you've gone from running a whole republic to being in lockdown arrest in the UK. Have have you adapted well? Do you think you've, you're you're well suited to lockdown, or are you glad that it's all over and it's starting to open back up? I actually, it has actually forced me to deliver my speeches on video. Mm. If that makes sense, so yeah. it's pushed me to do more video. So I have a weekly broadcast that I do, and I'm doing. I'm spending more time on Instagram and I'm using Facebook Live. But I think what is challenging for me, because you, as a character comedian, you have to be able to switch up. Mm. What I find really ridiculous, and my neighbors find it ridiculous, is, for example, there was a time I was doing a comedy sketch about Captain Tom, 
Remember Captain Tom, the guy um, who the Somali money? pirates? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the, the guy who raised money for NHS? Yes. Yeah, and, yeah. Okay. So I tried to do something similar uh, in my garden. And one of my neighbors saw me and he was shaking his head because he didn't know I was a comedian. He just thought maybe, damn, the lockdown has really got <laughs> in. Why would a black man be wearing a uniform and be walking in the garden and saying he wants to raise funds for the NHS? You understand what I'm saying? So my neighbors have now found out that I am a comedian and that I dress in the evening <laughs> to entertain my audience. <laughs> Do you see where I'm coming from? So that's it, that's it. That yeah. thing has been crazy. And, and then I look at myself and, 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 and I, you know, at times my wife uh, mm. sees me when I am about to dress to change into uniform and she shakes her head because I was never a president before she married me. <laughs> yeah? yeah. 15 years ago when she married me, I was a civilian. Now all of a sudden I'm calling myself President of Bonjo. She knows damn well that this must be some midlife crisis. Problem. <laughs> but then, she has to respect the uniform. And then what is really interesting is family members hearing your material. Oh. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because your material is not heard at home. And then yeah. all of a sudden, you are, on, you are at home and you are... Yeah, I remember there was, there was a comedian. I'm not going to go into, into his set. But yeah. he was really saying some really, really mm. deep stuff. And my wife basically said, darling, wow. What type of comedy? Uh, there are, yeah, there are some acts that really, instead of doing comedy, they'll just they'll just open up their crazy life for everyone to see. Yeah, yeah, but, but, but look, different strokes for different people. Right. I don't want people thinking I'm criticizing. What we're just saying is talking about the experience of the lockdown. Yeah, be it yeah. you're wearing the uniform or you're entertaining your audiences, your your family members see you dress in a uniform, your neighbors see you dress in a uniform. <laughs> it's a different ball game entirely. And then you have to switch up because you can't be president in your house for too long. Well, so no, no. You can you imagine? Day. I can, yeah. can you imagine your wife putting up with that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But the Zoom, the Zoom gigs, the Zoom gigs are, for me, I think, I think people should not rush to accept Zoom gigs. I think people should ask the comedy promoter, how is it going to work? Yeah. Do you think my act can work on this? I think that's good How advice. Yeah. And Those actually, the... what you're saying yeah. about treating it like like it's like a new format. Do you know what I mean? It's look, like look, 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 it's... it's a different it's a different skill. I haven't time. heard people say that before, so that's really interesting, actually. And it's like, why not practice this new skill instead of comparing it to the old? And you know, saying, "Oh, it's not as good," but like, but but where does that get you? It's like here we are now. With we're, we're only yeah. six months into a pandemic that could last for years. It's like you yeah. adapt or die, exactly. right? And and and, and, and the beauty, you see, the thing about it is this: I, I don't know how how often you were gigging, but I gigged regularly. I mean, my weekends was gigging. Yeah, you were. Lockdown work, forced me. Lockdown forced me to reflect on. Uh, you've heard the saying, walking smarter rather than harder. Mm. Yeah? Wait, so, wait, what's the saying? Walking, you have to walk smarter rather than harder. Uh, yeah? So yeah. one of the things I picked up was when lockdown started, especially at weekends, I was saying to myself, wow, I have so much time now to huh. do other things. However, why was I gigging like this every weekend? Boom, 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 boom. Mm. And there were three school. I, my, my view is that for the lockdown, there were three types of people. Mm. There were some people who realized this was an opportunity for me to actually reflect on where I'm going with my comedy. So I'm not even going to do any Zoom gigs. I'm just going to take this time to enjoy life. Yeah? Mm. There were some people who just jumped at it very quickly. Mm. Boom, I'm doing Zoom gigs. <laughs> <laughs> and they yeah. have never, ever had a break. It's almost like having some kind of manic depression. <laughs> <laughs> they're not having a break yeah. and then the third one is people who dip in or out because I have to say to you there were times when I would have gigs and I would say oh yeah when did I book this <laughs> because I feel that I should have a break but I had to do yeah. it because I have committed to doing it so because I know when this lockdown is over I know that when we get busy whatever that industry looks like mm. People are going to wish they had the time that they had during lockdown. Yeah, that's yeah. so true. 
They'll look back and they'll I be like, I had all this free time and I wasted it. It's so look, true. I don't, I don't, I do not miss the late nights. Mm. I do not miss the bad eating. Mm. I do not miss drive, miss driving, and then the the there's, there's a diversion and the journey mm. that was going to take one hour is taking two hours. Mm. I do not miss the car journeys with comedians. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, where you get so, fucking tickets for speeding because you you go so fast, you're like, shut up, you yeah, idiot! Yeah, yeah. I just want to go yeah, home. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and I I do not miss the travel costs. Mm. I mean, at one point, at one point, because I had some big gigs I was going to do during the lockdown, so I got refunds. You mm. won't believe how much refunds I got from tickets that I had. Um, well, that you paid. had some. You had some big gigs lined up with uh, Reginald D. Hunter, didn't you? That yeah, were... that was going to be, that was the, going to be the second time, and yeah. uh, that I was going to support Reginald D. Hunter. I had. I also was looking forward to you know performing because I'd written a show mm. about what happened last year. The title of the show is called Stolen, and mm. I, I was going to present it uh, to people to the world in August. But that's not happening. Uh, but, and that's why I'm not worried about COVID because people will still want to hear my story next year. I think so. Thing, yeah. Thing, yeah. Well, from what, really well, from what you've teased on, on the show today, and I know you've got an announcement on, on Friday, um, yeah. there, there's, there's some big news coming up. So I think pe- I've, wet, I've wet some people's beaks here with, with yeah. possible, you know, very exciting news. Uh, I'm, I'm a bit mindful of your time because I know you've got to go at eight. Um, yeah. so we'll, we'll wrap up a bit here. Um, yeah. just in, in sort of closing, what do you think of all the, all the craziness that's gone on in, in the comedy industry recently? It seems like a lot of, uh, a lot of eating itself, a lot of Im- implosion. Do you think that's just because we've not been able to perform and we've not had that support from the government? I, or... I, I, I think there are, I think there are a number, there are a number of issues. For me, I have been very, very shocked. Yeah. And I have to say to you, I did not know it was happening. I genuinely did not know because I am the sort of comedian who goes to perform. I do my performance and I go home. Mm. I don't socialize. So I do, I did not see these things, mm. but I was really, really taken aback mm. by the, not only the names mentioned mm. by the movement, which is a good thing. Mm. It is a good thing. Yeah. Amen. Let's yeah. not get this wrong. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's like, it's like, I, I would describe it like black lives matter. Where, for example, if you experience someone being racist to another person, you should be able to challenge them. And that's Mm. what needs to happen in the industry. Mm. If there's any sexist remarks, no matter how how you think it's going to affect you or you think that, okay, you're going to be be booked by this promoter, you should challenge them as Mm. a man. Mm. Yeah, you should challenge them as Mm. a man. I think that's really, really important. So I have been extremely shocked. I genuinely believe Um, that this is going to be really, really tough for male comedians now. Mm. Apart from the fact that male comedians have to behave themselves. Mm. Do you understand what I'm saying? But I think there will be some kind of recorrection. I call it like a stock market crash Mm. where women will definitely will be getting those spots Mm. um, moving forward in the future just to redress the balance. That seems like a good thing. It seems like it's been... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 I believe... That is a good thing. Mm. But you have you, you make a point which I, I will agree with you on. And that is why you need to question why has it taken the lockdown for this to happen? Yeah. Because if we were all gigging, you will be hearing these things quietly, but they wouldn't have come out exactly. in public. I certainly was really shocked to see Joe Rogan's podcast. I don't know if that's where I saw someone basically boasting about how he gets gigs oh yeah right yes i saw that i i I, when i saw that i was really really shocked and i just thought yeah he has opened the pandora box yeah yeah and the pandora box is going to be open i never expected it to affect the united kingdom when i saw it all happening in the united kingdom i was horrified Mm -hmm. and i said to myself who are these people that i gig with Mm. Because, you know, who are these people? I know. Why is the industry in such a state? But like I said, moving forward, it is a good thing. And my advice to anyone listening to this, if you experience that sort of thing, 
and you witness it, challenge them. Challenge them. Because That's just right. challenge, because it affects all male comedians. All male comedians are being tagged. Yeah, and I think yeah. now, going forwards, it seems like the industry may be shedding some old skin. And now, if you if if before you didn't feel safe to challenge, maybe now you will feel a bit more safe to challenge, knowing that more people will back you up, and that maybe this kind of behavior, this predatory behavior that's so disgusting, is on its way out. And it can be, uh, you know, we were forced into hibernation from forces beyond our control. That because of that, we might emerge from it stronger. I don't know. That sounds optimistic, but. I, no, hope, no, no, I hope you, so, you, President. You have to be optimistic. But look, I genuinely thought that COVID was going to be the threat to the comedy industry. Actually, it wasn't just COVID. It was a sex pest. <laughs> yeah? They, 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 you, know, they, you know, they have ruined you know, and damaged the yeah. industry, and it needs to recover. Yeah. And the only way it can recover is for everyone to abide by a code of conduct. Mm -hmm. You know? To abide by a code of conduct and behave, people need to behave. Male comedians need to behave. That's the thing, and isn't it? Yeah. And, take, and take responsibility for their actions and for things that they see. And don't be afraid. Because at the end of the day, you know what's really interesting about mm. all of this? Is all of us have been running around. I said have been running around for 10 years. Um, I'm going to leave you with this. Does mm. comedy really, really matter? Is it really a, a matter of life and death? I would say no. <laughs> Since March, nobody has been kicking. Most people haven't been any, anything since March. Mm. Yeah, it doesn't matter if you're a pro comic, a semi comic, mm. a semi pro, an amateur, starting the day. It doesn't matter what type of comic you are. Everybody has been put on the same level right now. Right. And either they're zooming it or they haven't got the energy to do anything because they're affected by the fact that they're not performing. What does that actually say? Mm. What does that actually mean for the industry? We go on about, you know, it, it's the audiences. The audiences, are certainly for me, I can speak for myself. It's the audiences who have carried me in this industry. Yeah, I couldn't yeah. agree more. That's, I mean, that's, yeah. yeah, that's why I love live performance so much. It's why, it, on, on any kind of stage, you know, I do theater and stuff. I was in the West End when, when COVID shut us all down. And it was, um, you know, I was like, I... I immediately i was like I, I need to find a way to connect with an audience again and i think a lot of performers have been feeling that and it's like maybe that's part of the reason you're doing your weekly uh yeah, announcements. yeah, I, I admit, yeah exactly because the, the, the challenge that i have faced as a as a president mm. is that my people want to hear from me because mm -hmm. that's what i picked up because once i finished on stage before covid people will be on my fan page interacting with me so mm -hmm. i had no choice but to continue to interact with my audience. And I have to say to you, they have been my strength. The fact that I have fans and I have audiences yes. who are my backbone, and I know whenever I post or post anything, they're going to comment about it. Well, you, we've, so they, we've all got your back here at the Bliss of the Abyss. It's, we, how, we many, are, how, many them, how many of them are ready to die for me? Well, <laughs> we will <laughs> test it. Forget this democracy. Let's, well, let's get some sign-ups. <laughs> for uh, this holy war that's coming. Uh, do you have some mm. final words for people listening who are big fans of yours, who, who are anxious to see what's happening next? Can you tease them anything? Can you give them support? Can you give them love? Can you give them hope? Yeah, I just want to say, I want to thank everybody. I don't know how many of your listeners you've got. How many listeners have you got? 15. <laughs> 15. We better improve. We, better, we have to improve it. Uh, but I, I just want to say, if there are any of your listeners out there, um, just um, key thing is they need to make sure they wear their mask yeah? yes. and they should thank their stars that are not in power because <laughs> if I was in power there will, no, there will be no debate about whether we have to wear a mask or not it will be mandatory anyone who does not, does not wear their mask is a shot up against the wall <laughs> yes. against the wall and I really do mean that because you know when I look at democracy in this country democracy is like a virus it's a vaccine we need, you know, sorry, it's a virus and we need to flatten the curve. And we need to do the vaccine. We need a vaccine. To yes. Get rid of the and the vaccine and the vaccine is dictatorship and you and will you be yeah, distributing it. Is, it. It is the abundant dictatorship. Because why? Look, look, the mask, for example, people said they should wear, 
China were wearing the mask in the second, mm. 22nd of January mm -hmm. this year, they were wearing the mask. Look how long it's taken Britain to agree that the mask needs to be worn. And then they're still debating. They still want a green paper and white paper. Oh, we need to encourage people. <laughs> we need people with common sense. It does not work. <laughs> Democracy is shit. <laughs> Strong, strong, powerful words to leave with, uh, yeah. President Obonjo. It has Mask. masks. Masks. Wear those Where masks. Yeah, you know, you should start um, manufacturing some with, the, you know, get your name on people's faces. Your loyal that army. Is good, that is a good idea. I actually have some military, military masks. Yeah, you know what yeah, to do. I'm, I'm, I'm actually. That is a good idea. I am going to. I am going to. I am actually going. To post on my fan page and ask my fans if they will buy a mask with my name on Get it. Yes, so much. Yep. Because President Trump, after how many months, is now wearing a mask and he has a presidential seal. There we go. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Listen, yeah. uh, President Obonjo, your time is precious, I know, and I do not want it to be shot. So I'm going to put on my mask and I'm going to wish you a good evening, sir. Thank you very much for being on the show. It's been an absolute yeah. pleasure. Let me know when you publish it, and I hope you get many likes. And uh, I think this has been a really, really good show. Great. Fantastic. Better than Joe Rogan's podcast. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you're a diamond. You're an angel. Nice one. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Take care. All right. Thank you. Uh, yes. What a star. Thank you, President. Um, I'm going to post links to... Uh, his his instagram facebook etc sign up and watch out for this friday for the big announcement on the year of the anniversary of the attempted attempted coup as if they could ever oust the real presidente salutations to you just before i go um just want to recommend a couple of tv shows i've been watching this week uh succession uh is Absolutely excellent. Written by one of the writers, I think it's Jesse Armstrong, of Peep Show. Uh, it's, it's not a new show, but I've only just watched it. And it's excellent. A uh, new show that I have watched that, what's the point in recommending it? Because everyone's going to recommend it, is I May Destroy You. It's really good. <laughs> and um, other than that, I would just say thanks for listening to this show. Um, I hope you've had a good one this week. I hope you've enjoyed uh, listening to all of this nonsense and that that you put it down after you finish with it and you go and give yourself a pat on the back and uh, maybe, you know, have a little reach around and see what's downstairs and have fun there. But no, that's not right, is it? Maybe go and find someone you love and give them a kiss right on their big, fat face. Or, failing all of that, have yourself a good week. And you know what? I'll see you soon on the bliss of the abyss. Thank you for listening to the show. That was the bliss of the abyss. All music provided by the incredibly talented Nils Hennis Steer. If you have anything you'd like to say, positive or negative, send it to the bliss of the abyss at gmail.com and I'll see you soon.
one. Pay knows with me. Uh, she's calling to see me the year in now, but I guess not. So I guess I will talk to you tomorrow. And um, have a good night. Talk to you then. Bye.